Uh, my name is John Bodner. I'm with the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Professor Ted Carmines of the Political Science Department. He will introduce our main speaker tonight, the person you come here to, to listen to. And I want to just mention that Professor Carmines has also been uh, a partner uh, as the Director of Research for the Center on Congress in helping to plan this series of speakers on the electorate this fall. So I give you Ted Carmines. Uh, thank you, John. We are delighted uh, to welcome Gary Jacobson uh, to be our third lecturer this year on the elections. Um, Gary is a professor of political science at the University of California at San Diego. Uh, he's a specialist in American politics with primary focus on Congress, congressional elections, and elections generally. Um, he's written uh, several books and many articles and has uh, many awards to his name. Uh, he served on the Council of the American Political Science Association as well as being its treasurer. He's been, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences from 1985 to 1993. He served on the Board of Overseers of the National Election Studies, uh, which plans the major data collection effort for congressional and presidential elections in the United States. Uh, and in 1990, 91, he was a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences. Uh, his lecture tonight is entitled The Bush Legacy in the 2008 Elections, and I'm delighted to welcome Gary Jacobs. Thank you, John, and thank you, Ted, for inviting me here. Can everyone hear in the back? I, I have a microphone just sort of sitting here. Is that okay? Okay, that, that, this should work then. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of stuff tonight, uh, and uh, uh, maybe more than you can digest, but I, I'm going to try anyway, just because I find it so interesting. Um, my, I, I began my research on the Bush administration uh, with the observation that he was, and this was a guy who, uh, as you may recall, when he was running for election in 2000, said he wanted to be a uniter, not a divider, someone who could bring together the, the warring faction, partisan factions that had broken out during the Clinton administration, kind of epitomized, epitomized by the impeachment events around uh, Clinton in 1998. And instead, uh, looking at data, you, uh, it turned out that he was the most divisive or polarizing president we've ever had uh, in terms of uh, the, the differences between the levels of support he got from ordinary Democrats and ordinary Republicans. That is, the, differ the difference in, in, in levels of approval rating were the highest ever. Uh, and I thought this was intriguing. I mean, it raised a question, why? What, what is it about the Bush administration or Bush that made him such a polarizing figure? And so I wrote a book to try to explain it to myself. And, uh, and uh, I came up with five answers. And I'll summarize them very briefly for you. Um, first of all, he, takes, he, takes, uh, he assumes the White House after three decades of increasing partisan polarization in the public as a whole. As you look at uh, the American, American polity, either at the mass level or at the elite level, the periods from the late 1970s until Bush takes over in 2001 is a period of increasing partisan division by almost any way you want to measure it, more among the elite than among everybody else, but uh, it's it, it was clear in ordinary citizens as well. Uh, Clinton's impeachment kind of epitomized that trend the, at the elite level. Second, of course, we all remember his route to the White House through Florida. That was a highly kind of polarizing event. It was, uh, you know, Gore wins the popular vote but loses, uh, loses the electoral vote uh, after Alaskan's vote, or after Florida's votes are given to Bush by the Supreme Court. Uh, if you looked at that process, it was, go it was a highly partisan process and you knew that Bush was going to be the winner because any place the final decision was going to be made was controlled by Republicans. The Supreme Court was controlled. There was a Republican majority on the Supreme Court, a Republican majority in, in the House of Representatives, a Republican majority in the Florida legislature. Any way it was going to go, it was going to be, uh, was going to be Bush. Uh, but after that event, a very large proportion of Democrats thought that he had been uh, elected illegitimately. A very large proportion of Republicans thought it was perfectly all right. He, he was the legitimate winner of the election. So that was polarizing as well. Um, Third thing is taking over a very evenly divided country. Remember, the Senate was 50-50 uh, well, until Jeffords, uh, Jeffords switched. Very narrow majority, uh, Republican majority in the House. Bush elected with less than a majority of the popular vote, the uh, minority of the popular vote. 
Um, uh, people were talking about there's going to be a coalition government. He's got to kind of reach out across party lines. Well, he really didn't do anything of the kind. He said, look, we won. Um, I've got my, we've got our agenda. It's the conservative Republican agenda with a couple of exceptions, leave no child behind and, and the prescription drug benefit. And we're going to govern from, the, we're going to pursue that agenda. And uh, it did so with a certain amount of success on the tax cuts and other things, which as a consequence were pleasing to Republicans, but rather displeasing to Democrats because it wasn't, it wasn't a consensual agenda, it was a partisan agenda. Um, and the way in which he achieved those victories uh, was by kind of ratcheting it up partisan pressure. And, and so that was also contributed to this polarization. By far the most important thing, and uh, I'll skip together, skip, skip up one. If you, when I'm talking about polarization and, and approval of Bush, I'm looking at numbers like that, especially during the years from uh, early 2004 through uh, 2006 or so, where uh, Republicans are overwhelmingly supportive of Bush, uh, overwhelming approval. Uh, give them very high approval ratings. And among Democrats, uh, the average dips below 20 points in January 04 and never goes up above their sense. So you have a, uh, that gap between the red line and the blue line is the largest gap you're ever going to see for any president so far. Okay? Uh, so what, uh, this, this is the uh, illustration of, of the partisanship. The, the Iraq War is the fourth thing on my list, the most important thing contributing to the partisan reactions to Bush, I think, was the Iraq War. Uh, this is, uh, like Bush, the most uh, divisive military engagement we've been in since World War II in terms of partisan divisions. You know, we were really divided about Vietnam, but partisan divisions on Vietnam averaged about six, seven percentage points. Democrats were a little more supportive before Nixon took over. And Republicans were a little more supportive after Nixon took over, but the gap between the parties was never very large. There was big divisions, but the divisions were within the parties rather than between the parties. For the Iraq War, you get um, initially pretty substantial divisions at the time the war breaks out, but nothing like you get later on, where there are, on average, since um, uh, the be beginning of, of uh, 2004, on average, about 55 to 60 percentage point gap between Republicans and Democrats on the war. Well, why was the war so polarizing? Uh, the, the obvious reason was that it was a, it was a war of discretion. It was a, it was a voluntary war. It was entered into uh, on, uh, on some premises that, uh, that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction and threatened the United States, that threatened the United States and its allies, that it was probably in cahoots with Al Qaeda and may have been connected with 9-11. Uh, those premises were fairly quickly discredited. Not immediately, but over, slowly over time, the weapons of mass destruction weren't found, an Al-Qaeda connection wasn't established. Uh, and so over time, those people who had supported the war because they believed in its premises, mainly th those Democrats and, and independents who supported the war, supported it because they believed in its premises. Once its premises melted, then their support disappeared. Whereas ordinary Republicans supported the war not because they necessarily believed in its premises, although they did, and many of them still do, uh, that is about 60% of the Republicans still believe there were weapons of mass destruction there. Uh, but they were willing to uh, follow Bush. They believed in George Bush, especially after 9-11. And they were perfectly willing to accept any of the fallback justifications for the war. So you've got this dramatic division where Democrats uh, and, and, uh, and, to a certain extent, independents lose their support for the war. I'll give you a cleaner version of that, um, uh, of that <coughs> chart. Uh, uh, they, their support disappears as the premises for the war become discredited. Republicans stick with it because they ex either don't notice that those uh, premises have been discredited or they accept the new justification that Iraq is the central front of the war on terror and therefore we have to fight it. So you have uh, a very divisive war contributing to this polarization. Uh, and then there's a fifth explanation that I don't dwell too much on, but there's some data on, and that is that the, the nature of the mass me uh, communication media, especially the news media, has changed over the past couple of decades to become far more fragmented so that uh, people are able to find news sources or information sources that are ideologically in tune with whatever views they happen to hold. So uh, you have this kind of mechanism where the news media reinforce people's biases, either for the, for the president uh, in support of the war or against the president in opposition to the war. So reinforcing this kind of, kind of polarization. Okay, that's a, that's a short version of the book. After writing it, and after having sent it out, it occurred to me, duh, uh, I was looking at partisanship as kind of an in the independent variable. How did partisanship affect reactions to Bush, affect reactions to the war, et cetera?
But there's another way of thinking about it. You switch the causal arrow around and say, okay, how did uh, reactions to Bush and the war shape partisanship? And so the question was, okay, how did, how did uh, the Bush administration, or how has the Bush, Bush administration affected people's attitudes toward the Republican and Democratic parties? Has it changed mass partisanship? Has it changed something about the party images? Just to uh, kind of round out the problems that if that's true, if in fact president, presidential performance shapes reactions to parties, evaluations of parties, and mass partisanship itself, then the Republicans are in a certain amount of trouble, or would be in a certain amount of trouble. You can predict that. Uh, you predict that um, this is the, simply the, uh, the relationship between Bush, uh, Bush's evaluations of Bush and the war. They both go down together. They're very tightly linked. Um, uh, when, you, when you have the individual surveys and you do the cross tabs on them, you can measure the consistency with which people either uh, support the war and, and approve of Bush or don't support the war, oppose the war and disapprove of Bush. Consistency level average is about 83%. That's very high. If you go back to uh, Truman in, in, in Korea, it's about 60%. If you go back to Johnson in Vietnam, it's about 64%. Here it's 83%. So you, you have this, this tight correlation. At the same time, uh, other, uh, the war and other things, and, and the other thing later, later on is in, in this last year is the economy, uh, bring the public uh, into a very unhappy state of mind about the direction of the country. It's a standard polling question, is the country going in the right direction, or off on the wrong track, or are you satisfied or dissatisfied uh, with the way the country is going? Uh, however the question is asked, you get the same kind of distribution of responses. It looks, uh, the dissatisfaction curve looks like that. If you do satisfaction and dissatisfaction, leave, leave out all the individual data points, it looks like that. You can see the quite dramatic effects of the recent economic problems at the, uh, at the tail end of those two trends, uh, where you have about 90% of the population unhappy about the direction of the country and less than 10% uh, saying it's, it's satisfactory. Um, this is unlikely to be good for, for the Republican Party. And evaluations of the economy itself, this is some positive evaluations minus negative evaluations. And you see we're down in sort of the minus 80 territories. Minus 100 is the lowest you can get. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, uh, uh, this, the perceptions of the economy now look about like they did in 1992 when Bill Clinton had the famous sign up in his campaign office, it's the, the economy stupid. Uh, well, it's, it's, we're, we're there again. Okay, well, the question was then, how did this affect, or how, how did uh, this affect views of the parties? And there are uh, various ways of looking at that. In, in uh, a couple of these, I just took the uh, polls like the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, they asked, occasionally uh, a question about uh, the views of the Republican Party. Do you think a bit positive, very positive, somewhat positive, very negative, somewhat negative. Uh, and you plot them along with the uh, um, approval, Bush's approval rating. You can see they track each other, not perfectly. The party never does as well as Bush when he's riding high, and it never does as poorly as Bush when he's riding low. But it, uh, it moves pretty much along with him. Uh, and uh, those green dots at the top, are, again, are, are just consistency points for those surveys where I could actually get my hand on the survey and do the cross tabs, get a very consistent uh, either evalu a positive evaluation of both or a negative evaluation of both. Doing the same thing with Gallup data on the question of, uh, of party favorability. Get the same kind of pattern. Uh, Bush and the party's positions uh, they tend to move together. If we just plot them out in a, in a, uh, in a, in a uh, point by point, uh, uh, with B Bush approval plotted against uh, either party favorability or or positive view of the party, you can see there's a quite ni nicely strong linear relationship between the two. Uh, for every point, or ten, say every 10 points Bush drops, party approval would drop about five points uh, by, by this kind of an estimate. So uh, there's clearly a relationship there, and given the, uh, uh, the decline in Bush's popularity, it's pretty much guaranteed to uh, uh, hurt the Republican Party. You break it down by partisans, again, you get a, a pretty nice linear relationship between approval of the president and approval of the party in each partisan category, although the intercepts of the, or the, the differences between the partisan categories, are, of course, are huge. The Democrats are down there in blue, uh, Republicans up there in red. But nonetheless, within each partisan category, you also have a, uh, have a pretty uh, strong linear relationship between uh, approval of the president and approval of the, approval of the party. Uh, it makes a certain amount of sense. I also then asked the auxiliary question, well, if it hurt the Republicans, did it help the Democrats? Uh, because these are two independent kind of evaluations, and it turns out not much. In fact, there's no relationship between evaluations of Bush and evaluations of the Democratic Party. 
Uh, it's, just, it's flat. That's a, basically a zero relationship. It's actually a little bit positive, but only because of those high numbers when Bush was very popular right after 9-11. Every single American institution was very popular after 9-11. Uh, we were not evaluating institutions in our usual fashion. We were evaluating like we do the flag and the Constitution for at least a couple of months. Uh, but outside of that, there's, there's essentially no relationship between the two. So if you just plot out uh, 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 opinions toward the party over time, the red line there, you can see they're uh, going from 9-11 on, uh, where they both start out at their, pretty much their highest points. Uh, Republicans' uh, favorability declines over time. Democrats really doesn't go up very much. They're pretty much flat. They pick up a little bit recently. Uh, but also notice something interesting at the end of this time series. In the last couple of points, uh, Republicans close the gap a little bit. Those are all right after the Republican convention. These are, these are uh, when, for the first time, Bush isn't the only face of the Republican Party anymore. There's a new face for the Republican Party, or two new faces. Uh, McCain and Palin come up. And that, uh, that has uh, uh, a positive effect. And it also suggests something about the relationship between uh, that, that this relationship between the president's image and the party image is malleable. To get a new president, to get a new face, uh, the party can recover fairly quickly from that. That's no, just because you're in pr uh, uh, having problems with Bush doesn't mean those problems are going to continue uh, if there's a subsequent Republican leader and Bush is no longer the, the face of the party. Uh, if the consequences are going to be long term, it's not going to show up in sort of party approval evaluations. It's going to show up in mass partisanship. That is, uh, in, in terms of party identification. If there's going to be an effect that's going to last, it will be the, uh, uh, the effect that it has on, uh, on, uh, on people's willingness to identi uh, identify with a party. Now, most theories, uh, the main theories of party identification, there's a psychological theory and there's a kind of an economic theory, but both of them allow presidential approval to affect, at least in the short run, mass partisanship uh, to some extent. And clearly, in Bush's case, it did. But again, I've plotted out here the monthly averages of, uh, of the Republican share of two party uh, identifiers, major party identifiers, plotted against uh, the percent approving of Bush's job performance. And again, it's not strictly linear, but it's a pretty linear relationship, pretty clear linear relationship between the two. The more popular Bush is, the more people there are that call themselves Republicans. And the less popular Bush are is the fewer uh, people who call themselves Republicans. Uh, and that turns out to be the case. That, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, the Gallup polls over time in terms of mass partisanship, you can see that during the first Bush term, the parties were running pretty even. Uh, there were at some points where there, there were more Republicans and Democrats, and, uh, but by and large, you'd say the parties were at neck and neck through that period. During the Bush's second term, the Democrats uh, uh, developed a quite substantial lead, in, at least in the Gallup poll mass party identification, which again narrowed down just briefly, at any way, after the uh, most recently after the Republican nomination. And then uh, taking out the, uh, the, the independent leaners, you get a sim similar pattern, al although a smaller gap, with again, uh, a Republican Party sinking, uh, Democratic Party uh, gaining some inheritance, but not to the degree that the Republican Party was losing them. They were showing up more in the, on the independent side. Now, uh, and then one more, one more <coughs> element of this, uh, looking at a longer time period, uh, the average proportion in an, uh, annual average of uh, the proportion of, uh, of Republicans among party identifiers in the major national uh, polls, ABC News, CBS News, New York Times, Pew, Harris, and Gallup. Those are the ones I can t take back 20 or 25 years. Uh, and you can see an interesting pattern. There's a very consistent um, movement of all of them. They all move together. There's a gap between them that you can see that, uh, that Gallup tends to be more Republican and uh, Harris tends to be more Democratic. But nonetheless, they all parallel each other very nicely. Uh, and you can see that the, the Republicans kind of uh, hit a high point in 2003. This is after 9-11. This is uh, when Bush is at his most popular. Uh, and then since then, it's been, it's been downhill to whereby through uh, September of 2008, um, on average, uh, partisanship is uh, less Republican than at any time it's been since the end of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Reagan administration, or the second, uh, second Reagan administration, where the Republicans really uh, uh, picked up significantly. So uh, look at that and you say, well, B Bush has not been good for the Republican Party, at least over the last six years. But also, if you look at that, you say, well, yeah, that's, but that's kind of a sine wave. And what happens to sine waves? They go up and down and up and down. And now that it's down, it'll go back up, which is not, uh, not, not, not uh, an entirely uh, unlikely thing to happen. Uh, so a Republican looking at this, these patterns would say, okay, well, Bush is going to be gone uh, uh, 
things will change, our for fortunes will improve once he's gone. And especially if there's a Democrat in the White House that has to try to satisfy a disgruntled and fickle public. Uh, the thing that the Republicans ought to be more worried about, however, is another trend that shows up in the data. And that's the degree to which people just entering the electorate during the Bush administration have uh, drifted into the Democratic Party. This is important because uh, standard theories of party identification suggest that people become partisans or find their partisan identity in uh, their first few elections or few years when they're politically active, usually in their 20s. Okay? Uh, and that once they've developed that kind of uh, association with a party, it tends to be pretty stable. So a lot matters about how you get socialized into politics, what the conditions are when that happens. This chart illustrates this, in, I think, in a spectacular way. This was done uh, with using Pew data for 2006 from, from uh, about 17,000 observations from all, their, all of their surveys. It was done by a former student, student of mine, Mike Dimmock, who's a, a very good guy and gave me this data. Um, this was in the New York Times. What it is, is each one of these points represents blue uh, Democrat, red Republican, the average current partisanship of people according to when they turn 20. Okay, so people who had turned 20 back during the Eisenhower years, where, the Repu where Eisenhower was a very popular Republican president, Republicans and Democrats were running pretty even. Those who turned 20 during the Kennedy Johnson years and even more so during the Nixon Ford years tended to be Democratic. Those who turned 20 during the Reagan and, and later Reagan and, and Bush first Bush administrations <coughs> tend to be pretty evenly Republican and Democratic. Well, what's happened since then? Since then, you have uh, uh, a, a drift where, to where the gap between uh, Republicans and Democrats um, among young people, uh, or among people entering the 20-year-old range, is the widest it's been during this entire time period. That is, people who came of age during the Bush administration uh, are the most Democratic cohort of any existing out there now in the electorate. So there's a, uh, uh, people who came of age during the Bush administration are 15 points more Democratic than Republican. Uh, you can see what each, each administration, uh, what, its, what its record is. The best one was Bush, but he was really following on Reagan for the first Bush. But also notice that this trend preceded Bush. It happened before Bush became, it began before Bush became president. Go back to there, you can see it, it, it's during the Clinton years that that, that gap begins to expand. So you can't blame it all on Bush. Now you can blame part of it on Bush. If you look at um, uh, approval of Bush broken down by age, you can see that the blue line, those are the people, eight, the 18 to 29 year olds during this period, uh, have a more negative or less positive view of Bush's performance than the older age groups. The most positive is 30 to 49. That's going to the Reagan generation. That's where there are more Republicans in that generation, more Democrats in the, in the blue generation. So it, it's clear that Bush was not, uh, was uh, unusually unpopular among, uh, among younger voters. And it, of course, as soon as I saw that, I said, oh, I know why this is. It's the war in Iraq, right? The young people don't like the war. It turns out that's totally wrong. In fact, young, young, young Democrats, whoops, uh, I'll, I'll get to that, I'll come back to that. Young Democrats are more supportive of the war uh, than are older Democrats. This is from uh, 17 Gallup polls taken from January through 07 through April 08, the most re recent ones where I could do this analysis, basically. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, among Democrats, the, the younger cohort is uh, twice as supportive of the war uh, as the older cohort, and they're more likely to support the war even though they disapprove of Bush. Their consistency of their views on the war and the views on Bush is lower at 77% than the consistency of the older Democrats at 85%. Let me go back to for this. Um, if you look at those party favorability numbers I showed you earlier, and you break it down, just look at the voters under 30, and see over the, over the period of the Bush administration, uh, the Democratic Party's numbers go up, the Republican Party's numbers go down. If you compare the size of that gap over time between the uh, under 30s and the over 30s, uh, uh, you can see that the, the gap increases uh, in the Democrats' favor among all age groups over 2006, 2007, 2008 but among young, younger voters to a to really a kind of exaggerated degree. Uh, so you know, part of the enthusiasm for uh, Obama among young people is just that he's a Democrat. And, they, and it, it, this was happening before he was on the radar screen for, uh, for lots, of, lots of folks in that, era, in, that, in, that, uh, in that domain. So 
Uh, if it wasn't the war, what was mm -hmm. it? And uh, rumbling around in the data, it became pretty clear that it's not the war, but it was the social issues uh, uh, that divide the parties that have uh, pushed the younger generation toward the Democrats and away from the Republicans. Uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, uh, questions having to do with social issues, uh, and, and more broadly, uh, ideological uh, issues that have an ideological frame and ideological content to them. You find that younger voters tend to be uh, more positive about government, more accepting of homosexuality, gay marriage, gay rights, more favorable toward immigrants, uh, less, um, uh, more inclined to believe in evolution rather than creationism. They tend to be less uh, religious. They tend to be le uh, more, more likely to call themselves liberals. If you're the standard liberal conservative, are you liberal or conservative or something else, you know, moderate. Uh, among the overall population, there are always more conservatives than, than, than liberals, often by about two to one. And among the uh, older age cohort, it's about two to one. Among the younger age, uh, younger cohort, it's about one to one. That is, they're almost even, uh, and uh, as much lower proportion calling themselves conservatives and a higher proportion calling themselves liberals, about t ten points in either direction. Uh, and the explanation of this, again, derives from the standard kind of social psychological interpretation of part party identification. Uh, the notion here is that people develop stereotypes about which groups belong to which party. And they come to identify with that party that has people that seem like them. You know, you go with the party where your folks are. People, people who are like you uh, tend, tend, tend to end up. Uh, and therefore, I think as religious and social conservatives have become an increasingly prominent part of the Republican coalition, uh, not just the rank, not just leadership and rank and file and leadership. Um, younger voters with moderate or liberal attitudes are going to find themselves uh, find it harder and harder to see themselves as part of that coalition, to think of themselves as Republicans. Um, you know, younger Americans with relatively liberal social views are unlikely to see themselves as in a party where there's a large and vocal segment wants to ban abortion, same-sex marriage, rejects evolution, denies the reality of global warming. Um, and it's hard to, I'm, I try to imagine this age group thinking that abstinence only is the way that you deal with sex education. It just doesn't compute uh, in, in my knowledge of this, this age group. So uh, as a consequence, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, the image of the Republican Party as nominated by social conservatives has had the long-term effect of making it less appealing to younger voters. Uh, and that that's, uh, that consequence is likely to last uh, for some time. There's also the fact that these uh, people have come of age during a, an administration that has messed up a lot of things. I mean, there's just been a lot of uh, uh, failed policies, uh, not just the war, but uh, dealing with Hurricane Katrina. We now got an economic meltdown, a whole series of things that made the administration not look terribly competent. And that's not going to help uh, with younger voters either. And then one more thing I'd like to throw in here is, you know, where do these people get their entertainment about politics? They, they don't get it from Bill O'Reilly. They get it from Jon Stewart. They get it from Stephen Colbert. So that the, the, the sort of the cultural uh, ma manifestation of, of politics on the humorous side, on the satirical side, has been one that's been anti-Republican and pro-Democratic. That may have uh, uh, helped make being a Democrat more fashionable and being a Republican less fashionable among, among the youth than it, than it was before. Okay, so this, this, is, uh, uh, the, the, this was the stuff that, after I wrote the book, I thought about how has Bush affected the party. It looks like it's affected the party in, in, a quite, uh, uh, in two ways, in the short run in terms of the overall party image, in the long run in terms of the overall makeup of the, part, of the party coalitions in a way that, uh, you know, you'll, I can imagine there's going to be a kind of standoff between the, the Democratic generation coming under, under George Bush Jr. and the Republican generation that came of age during his father's administration and, and, and the Reagan administrations. And these are going to be the two kind of uh, partisan opposites uh, in general among the generations for the next 20, 30, 40 years, as long as the Reagan people stay alive. Uh, so that, that, that kind of sets up things. What I'd like to do now is, is do a shift over and turn this into the background for talking about the coming election. I assume some of you are interested in that. Uh, and, and that uh, it's still going on, isn't it? There's a little event tonight later on where, the, uh, where uh, those of us who care about these things will pay some attention. Um, and uh, I want to think of th thinking about how this then will play into um, uh, the upcoming election. The first thing 
uh, to mention is to the obvious that not just uh, th this shift in partisanship that I've talked about, and the shift in partisanship especially among young people, is part of the story, but those charts I showed you early about the state of the economy, the unhappiness of the population with the direction of the country, uh, Bush's uh, standing with the public down to uh, the 20s now, uh, close to the bottom, close to the worst anybody's ever had. Okay? All of those suggest, obviously, this is going to be a terrible year to be a Republican and a great year to be a Democrat. That, uh, that uh, every once in a while there's an election with a strong partisan national tide. This is one of those elections where all, all of the things line up to be a very strong pro-democratic, anti-Republican national tide. And certainly, if you look at uh, the House and the Senate races, the congressional races, which has my, been my specialty for most of my career, it's pretty clear that that tide is going to uh, wash a considerable number of seats from the Republican side to the Democratic side. Just how many, we don't know. Uh, but we have a really nice leading indicator. For, for congressional races, if you want to know what's going to happen, you can, you can anticipate what's going to happen by looking at the anticipations that the politicians make about what's going to happen. Uh, that is, who retires? and who tries to run for higher office. Uh, and at, at, between 2006 and now, there were in the House of Representatives 26 voluntary Republican retirements and exactly six voluntary Democratic retirements. Of those 26 Republicans, 23 were pure retirements. They weren't running for higher office. Three were running for higher office. Among those six Democrats, three were running for higher office. Only three pure retirements. So 23 to three on the pure retirement front. You look at the Senate. Uh, you get a similar kind of pattern. There were no Democratic retirements. There were five Republican retirements in the Senate. Uh, moreover, Democrats have a great structural advantage in the Senate this time around. There are only 12 seats up that they hold. There are 24 seats up that the Republicans hold. Uh, so it's pretty predictable uh, that the Democrats are going to do fine at the House level. They'll pick up 10 to 20 seats uh, in a wild, if it gets, gets even weirder, uh, in the last couple of weeks. Maybe they'll pick up more than that, but I think 10 to 20 is a reasonable range. They should pick up, oh, four to six seats in the Senate, maybe seven at the outside, something like that. Um, if you look at the generic House polls, um, they're now running uh, on, uh, in, on a Democratic side about as high as they did uh, when the Democrats took over in 2006. These are extremely noisy data, by the way. When you do generic polls, they're all over the map. This was, this was Gallup. Uh, about three weeks ago, they had their, the, only, the only one which I've seen in the last year where they say that the, the de Republicans are going to get more votes than the, than the Democrats. The rest of them are clustered around uh, a Democratic advantage, but it's really noisy data. These are, not, uh, these are kind of guesses. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if, if, the, if the future resembles the past, some data missing from this one for some reason, but anyway. Uh, and then uh, a similar question, uh, which party do you want to control Congress? Uh, again, the Democrats have a, have a clear advantage on that question. So if you look at the congressional side, you say, yeah, it's going to be a great Democratic year. The only thing that's preventing it from being even greater is that the Re Democrats have won most of the low-hanging Republican fruit already. There are a lot of districts held by Republicans that are either Democratic-leaning districts or even toss-up districts. So to take more than 10 or 12 seats, they have to win in pretty Republican territory. And that's not all that easy these days when people vote uh, along party lines more assiduously than they've done uh, in, uh, in, in recent decades. Uh, but it's, it's predictable the Democrats are going to gain in the House and the Senate. Everybody's predicting that, including the Republicans. It's a done deal. Uh, why then is this not true at the presidential level as well? Because you think, well, um, you know, if it's going to go that way at the House, how could a Republican possibly be even close to winning the presidential race? Uh, and I think, uh, and until you know, last week or two weeks ago, the data suggested that the race was very, very close and that McCain had a very good chance of winning. He still may have a chance of winning, but it, the, the numbers have shifted against him uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and so that, the question of why, what is it about the election that, um, what is it that made McCain competitive in the way that none of the others was, uh, again, is a question with, uh, I think, several uh, uh, mutually reinforcing answers. The first one is McCain. The Republicans uh, kind of accidentally backed into nominating the only one of their candidates who would have been at all competitive under these circumstances. Why? Because he's the least Republican of all the Republicans out there. His identity is least tied up with that of his party uh, of any of the uh, Republican candidates. If you look back to January, 
when, uh, when polls were running matchups between uh, either Obama uh, and Clinton or McCain, Huckabee, Romney, and Giuliani, you can see that either Obama or Clinton is running double digits ahead of any of them except for McCain. For McCain, they're tied. Uh, they're, 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 they're virtually tied. Now, how they backed into nominating McCain, I'm not going to go into great detail on that. But basically, uh, I, I see the process, the Republican process at that time uh, during the primary is one where McCain was sort of there. Everybody knew, knew, knew who he was. He was available. He was running. But he wasn't satisfactory. And so they went through a process of auditioning. And they auditioned Giuliani, and he flopped. They auditioned Thompson, and, and as soon as he started running, he flopped. He looked really good until he started running. Uh, they, they, auditioned, they auditioned Romney, and he didn't make the sale. And he spent a lot of money trying to make it and didn't make it. They auditioned Huckabee, and he was an attractive guy, but you know, he was a little bit wacky, and he never got quite above that. And finally he said, well, okay, we auditioned all these guys. None of them's quite going to make it. I guess there's McCain. And then McCain in the poll goes, McCain then shoots up in the poll. So they kind of backed into to nominating him Fault de Mew, and they were very lucky that they did, because he was the only one that would be uh, potentially competitive here. A second thing that has helped McCain uh, remain competitive, at least until recently, was the fact that the surge has helped. That is, the, uh, uh, the number of American casualties in Iraq has been lower in the last two or three months than at any time since the war started. Uh, and McCain, as an early and vocal supporter of the surge, uh, uh, can claim credit for that. It doesn't help him so much, but if, if it hadn't worked, he'd be a dead duck. Uh, by, uh, that, that, that is, that it, it kind of took that problem off the table. He's been trying to uh, gain, get some traction from it, and it, but, it, it, but that traction offsets the fact that if you didn't like the war, uh, you, you're, you may be happy it's going better, but you didn't like going into there in the first place, and he's certainly uh, on the wrong side of that if you, if you thought the war was a mistake. So anyway, it neutralized. Uh, it was good enough to at least neutralize the issue and maybe work to, work to his, event, uh, his, uh, his benefit. A third thing is that the Democrats underwent this bruising primary between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. They were pretty evenly matched. Uh, he ends up winning, but he ends up winning basically by uh, out-organizing her. She gets almost as many votes in the primaries as he does. Uh, if there were a winner-take-all system in the Democratic uh, Party like there is in the Republican Party, she would have won the nomination. So it's very close, and a, a number of her supporters, at least were initially, were quite bitter about her loss. And therefore, uh, you had a, a divided Democratic Party. Most of that's gone away, as far as I can tell from the data, data now. But, for, uh, but until recently, it, it hadn't. Uh, and that, uh, that also gave, uh, gave um, um, an, an advantage, an opportunity to uh, uh, McCain that wouldn't have been there. Uh, probably the most important thing, however, is that Barack Obama is black. Uh, and you know there's going to be a racial penalty out there somewhere for being black when you're running for president. Just as uh, on, a, on a greater scale, but very similar to the kind of penalty, uh, uh, religious penalty John Kennedy uh, paid in 1960. In 1960, uh, Kennedy lost votes among Democratic Protestants who wouldn't vote for a Catholic. He won votes among Catholics who wouldn't necessarily vote for a Democrat, but would vote for a Catholic for the, uh, when they got the opportunity. The net of that, as estimated at least by the one major study that did this, was that Kennedy uh, gained some votes, lost some votes, lost more than he gained, uh, uh, lost about two and a half points nationally, and that's what made the election really, really close. Okay? So one would expect something like that to happen with Obama, except that on the, on the upside, since African Americans vote Democratic at overwhelming percentages anyway, there isn't a big upside except for turnout. And that's, that's one thing to look at look for in this election. Whereas residual racism out there, and there's a considerable amount of it, is going to cost him something. Uh, and the, the key issue, I think, with regard to that, from a point of view of looking forward to the election, or at the election, is the degree to which that phenomenon is already incorporated into the public opinion data that we've got on the war. Yeah. Are, are, are people lying about their preference? Or are they, uh, uh, if they, you know, so I, you know, I say I'm going to vote for Obama, and I really not because he's black. I, 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 or uh, are we getting a sincere statement about people's preference, who they're going to vote for, uh, and people are perfectly comfortable, even if it's a racial vote, saying, well, he's inexperienced, he's too liberal, et cetera. Um, whether it's, a real question is whether or not the, the racial element is already incorporated into the data we're looking at when we look at straw polls and horse race polls and so forth or not. I tend to think that it is already incorporated. I don't, I don't think there's any stigma, social stigma in not supporting Obama. 
uh, there's perfectly you know, legitimate reasons for, for supporting McCain, and that therefore uh, you don't have to secretly hide for, uh, to avoid social disapprobation your, your support for McCain rather than Obama. But you can never be sure, for, sure of that. Um, uh, and then in the short term, you could add a, a fifth thing to that, his nomination of, uh, at least for a brief moment, his nomination of Sarah Palin as his, uh, uh, as his um, vice presidential nominee had a positive effect on his numbers, uh, uh, at, least, uh, at least briefly. If we look at the average of the horse race polls over, uh, the, over this year, uh, you can see that the moment when um, uh, this was right after Palin was chosen, this is the moment, the week, a couple of weeks right after the Republican convention, uh, where McCain really closes the gap and actually goes ahead on average in the polls for, for a few days. Since then, uh, the trend has been in the other direction, uh, and that has, of course, a, a great deal to do with the meltdown of the economy, or at least the threatened meltdown of the economy, the collapse of the stock market, the, uh, the subprime uh, problems, and so forth, the economy being brought back into, uh, into the issue. Um, you think about, I mean, I, I was giving talks in January about what was going to happen, and at that time I predicted quite accurately what both candidates, what both campaigns were going to campaign on, no matter who was nominated. That is, this, this was one of those elections where you could predict what the campaigns were going to be before there were any campaigns and before there were any campaigners to campaign. You knew that whoever was chosen by the Democrats would attack the Republicans on the basis of George Bush. Say, whatever Republican was nominated would be a, a, accused of being the third Bush administration. Uh, uh, that they would do everything they could to take all that public discontent with the Bush administration and apply it to the Republican candidates. The most obvious strategy, it's one that, that they would have been uh, insane not to follow. Um, McCain, again, I, uh, was the one Republican that had the uh, best chance of avoiding that, uh, that kind of attack uh, by uh, separating himself uh, from his party by running as a, emphasizing his maverick status, emphasizing his, his bipartisan activities. Um, and, I mean, we, and we ended up having this very interesting campaign where you have both candidates running against the current administration. We, I've never observed this before, but basically that's what we have. We have both candidates running against the current administration. Uh, McCain more plausibly than almost any other Republican under those circumstances. Still, it's a, it's a tough shot for him. Uh, partly because a lot of his basic policies are, are extensions of the Bush administration. His foreign policy is, is n not uh, distinguishable from that of George Bush, it's, uh, other than being a little more hawkish. Uh, and uh, and his, uh, his economic policies are basically Bush. He changed his mind on the tax cut and his uh, added, uh, uh, views on Social Security, talk, at least until recently, talked about the thing, kinds of things that Bush talked about, privatizing product and so forth. So in terms of his, the fundamental economic and, and um, foreign policies that he would uh, propose, they look a lot like Bush. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't, you know, we're going to uh, earmarks and all that kind of stuff, but that's kind of peripheral. So basically he's a, you know, he's a, uh, a Republican when it comes to economic policies and, uh, and calling him one and trying to be something else is a very difficult th thing for him to do. The Republican's predictable theme was what? If you elect a Democrat, what's going to happen? He's going to raise taxes, but that—that's that, always that's that, that's a uh, uh, Republican theme that'll show up under any circumstances, any year. That's true. Yeah. Two things: you won't be safe, and you'll raise your taxes. And national security: that if you elect a Democrat, whoever it is, uh, they won't be tough enough on terrorists. They're they're not going to be tough enough to protect America from its foreign enemies. Uh, and that uh, any Democrat who was nominated would be accused of being too soft. Now, another element came into the campaign, which, which I didn't predict, uh, and that is kind of a revival of um, the culture wars, and that came with the nomination of Sarah Palin. Uh, that element was not, you wouldn't think of that as, as being terribly profitable uh, uh, to, to a McCain, because that's not what he is. That's not what he has been traditionally, anyway, in terms of his politics. But by the choice of, uh, of, of Sarah Palin, he kind of revived the culture wars, uh, mobilized social conservatives, uh, uh, mobilized the kind of class resentments that, uh, go, uh, that Republicans have been using fairly successfully back to Nixon to get working class voters to support uh, uh, their candidates in the face of perhaps their economic interests. Um, 
Uh, as it turns out, uh, McCain's luck may have run out. Uh, that is the, the high point that's shown here, or you can see it if you just do it, the two-party uh, uh, two preferences, take, taking out this, is a, uh, this moment here. It uh, doesn't last too long, and it doesn't last too long for a couple of reasons. One is that when you think about these, here's these two campaigns. One is, wants you to think about Bush, his economy, his policies, and, and to remind you how unhappy you are about the economy and his policies. And here's the other campaign trying to make you forget about that and think about your, nation, your security, think about national, uh, international policy, think about wars in Iraq uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and the economy tanks. And that takes the frame that the Democrats want to use and blows that up to be the one that people really focus on. And once they focus on that frame, then uh, uh, Obama does very well. Uh, it, it takes away from um, uh, the frame that McCain wants you to focus on and th the strength that he has in terms of foreign policy and pushes it over to a frame that benefits the Demo Democrats and benefits Obama. Uh, and um, the second thing is that the, the Palin bump fades fairly quickly. She turns out to be a high risk choice as everybody thought, but we didn't know exactly how, how risky it was. Um, her favorability numbers start out pretty high among those with an opinion, and at first a lot of people don't have an opinion because they never heard of her. But as, as opinions develop, it's been, it's been uh, pretty much a downward trajectory. Uh, and more important, the question of whether or not she's qualified to be president um, uh, has, I think, come back at least to some extent to haunt the, uh, haunt the administration. Uh, this is a, a, a Biden com Palin comparison. Uh, does this person have the uh, qualifications, preparation, experience, et cetera? The questions are asked in different ways to be president. Uh, Biden uh, does considerably better than Palin on this, and he gets a bump from the debate. He goes up after the debate on these numbers. She doesn't. She goes up a little bit, but uh, she's basically down there uh, with about 40 percent thinking she's qualified, or then the, the other side, unqualified. Uh, the proportion thinking that she's unqualified is generally above 50 percent after the debate. There's one at 49, the rest are at 50 or above. Very few think that Biden isn't qualified. So the, 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 the uh, brief uh, benefit he got from her candidacy, I think, eventually has faded. It's faded in part because uh, her, uh, her performance uh, has demonstrated that you know, there's questions about her qualifications. Uh, but also, again, because the economy has come to dominate so much the way people are thinking about these things. Um, as you know, uh, the national electorate, electorate doesn't choose the president. It's done on a state-by-state -state basis with electoral votes. Um, there are various ways of looking at this map. I, you're looking at this one because this was the easiest one to download from the internet. I tried to do some others, and they weren't, they weren't being cooperative. didn't cooperate. This one cooperated, so I could copy it onto here. But it's pretty much like the rest of them. Indiana is shown to be a little bit pink, a little bit uh, Democratic or Republican in this one. Some of the other ones have it toss up or even, even a little bit blue. I think it's probably a little bit pink still. Uh, but no, nonetheless, that's, that's the way that uh, things look uh, approximately now. That's one of the guesses. And, uh, uh, and looking at the overall outcome uh, predicted by this, this particular website anyway, you have an Obama victory, uh, Democrats picking up uh, seven seats in the Senate uh, and about, let's see, that's about 14 in the House, something like that, 13 or 14 in the House. Uh, these are reasonable estimates of, uh, of what will happen uh, as long as nothing dramatic or surprising happens in the next three weeks. Uh, assuming nothing dramatic or surprising happens in the next three weeks, there are two things that I'm going to be looking for on election night and trying to figure out uh, things I don't know yet. One is I've already mentioned, the racial the racial element. Will there be a racial penalty paid that's not already reflected in the data? Because it's possible to imagine that you know, Obama now has about an eight or nine point lead on average in the polls, that that would be a 15 point lead if he were white. I think, that, I think that's, that, that, that's an arguable point. Uh, but the other thing is, th is th going back to these, all these young uh, Democratic Obama supporters. Will they actually vote? Uh, this is the group, this is the cohort, the age cohort in the population has the lowest turnout rate of any group in the population, okay, on average. Uh, they, you know, they don't vote. They don't vote. As, and, and, you know, the retirees vote in very high, very high numbers and, and at the other end of the age distribution, very low numbers. The Obama campaign managed to mobilize them very effectively during the primaries. 
They're putting on an enormous effort to mobilize them for the general election. If it succeeds, then I think there's no question that he's, he's going to win a, a quite substantial victory. Uh, if he can get, uh, get to the polls those people that uh, he thinks are going to vote for him, uh, then uh, that, that, that's going to happen. But we haven't observed that successful, any candidate doing that successfully before in the same way. Although we did see some very effective mobilization in 2004 on both sides, but more on the Republican side than the Democratic side. That was an election with, uh, where the, the electorate went from about 105 million up to 117 million just in four years. That was a big, big jump. Uh, and in fact, the Kerry people met their target. They got as many votes as they thought they needed to win the election. It's just that the Bush people had a higher target and, and outdid them, got even more, mobilized their side even more. So the other thing to look at uh, on election night, I think, is turnout figures. And if you see the states coming in with extraordinarily high levels of turnout, then it, looks, it would look better for Obama. If, if the turnout is not extraordinarily high, then it's going to be a lot chancier for him. So with that, I will end uh, and open myself up to questions. I told you there was going to be a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff up there. Questions? Yes. This is just a little strange, but Obama is part white, so I don't see why. I mean, do you have any reason or any comment on why people would just focus on the fact that he's kind of black? Or well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what you can say, he is, he is, he is, not, he is non-white in some sense. He's, he's half white and half black. He's actually African-American. You think of that, that is, as, as, as a true description of him. He's, you know, his father's from Africa, his mother's an American. Uh, and uh, he, I, think it, I think it's that he consciously chose an identity as being an African-American, a black. Moved to Chicago, south side Chicago politics, south, 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 south side Chicago church, that he made a choice that this is, this is the identi identity I'm going to kind of project. And so I think it's fair to say, OK, that's the identity you've chosen. We'll, we'll, we'll accept that. And we'll, uh, you, we'll think of you as an African American. Yes? I'm curious as to why you didn't mention Ron Paul when you gave your Well, because Ron Paul isn't going to get 1% of the vote <laughs> and is not going to be decisive in any state. That's why. I mean, he, he's, he could be the, the protest vote of Republicans who, uh, who, who want to, um, who, who, are, who are furious at Bush and, fu and furious that all the Republicans were going against the free market principles in trying to deal with the, uh, um, uh, the meltdown in the, in the financial markets. So Paul will pick up folks like that, but I think it's one of, this is one of those elections where people are going to um, care enough about the difference between the two top candidates that not very many of them are, are going to vote a straight protest vote, which, which a Ron Paul vote would be. Yes. Uh, same, same with Ralph Nader. Two quick questions. One, on the issue of the, the buried uh, racist vote, uh, you, you said you, there's no stigma, but surely the issue is not stigma, it's consistency. In other words, if people know or they feel or they're seen as Democrats and they, they may not vote as Democrats, then what they can't do in the polls is bring themselves to speak inconsistently with themselves, but in the polling booth, they may say, in other words, isn't the hidden vote not about stigma, but about consistency? Well, maybe, maybe, but you, you, can, you know, you get 10% of the Democrats say they're going to vote for McCain, and uh, there's been no problem with Democrats voting for Bush uh, if they liked him, and, you know, 10% or 8% of them did in 2004, maybe 10% in 2000. So the idea of voting for somebody in the other party is not, ter is not terribly frowned on. And in most of these polls, the party question is asked after the presidential preference question. So you've already said who you're going to vote for for president before you've said which party you're in. So in terms of embarrassing your, being, being consistent for the interviewer anyway, as opposed to, to yourself, you don't have a problem. Yes? Um, yeah, in the beginning of your presentation, you kind of hammered, all the, hammered home the point that approval ratings for the Republican Party are going down with uh, you know, decreasing approval for Bush. Um, and then you said there's no correlation between that and increasing support for the Democratic Party. So I guess my question is, 
what are all those people that are angry at what the Republican Party is doing? Like, what are they doing now? <laughs> well, they can, be, they can be unhappy with the Republicans, but they don't think the Democrats are all that much better. I mean, it, 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 just because you don't like the Republicans doesn't mean you like the Democrats. You could say a plague on both your houses. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, a fair number of people do, do take that position. Interestingly enough, I looked at the same numbers for the Clinton administration. And for the Clinton administration, there's a strong positive relationship between evaluations of Clinton and evaluations of the Democratic Party, just like there is for Bush. In fact, the slope is almost identical. But there is a st also a strong significant negative relationship between positive views of, uh, of Clinton and negative views of the Republican Party. And I asked the question, why is this different for Clinton than for Bush? And you think about it, well, under what circumstances was Clinton very popular? He was most popular when they were trying to impeach him. Okay? His, his numbers go up. When you follow this trace, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. He's going along looking pretty good, and then, then uh, the, the Lewinsky scandal hits, and he goes up to the highest point in his, in his presidency in terms of approval, and he stays up there while they're trying to impeach him. Okay? So you have a very popular president, and then this party trying to impeach him, so there's a negative relationship between liking Clinton and liking the Republican Party during that period. So it's, it's the context uh, that, that, uh, that does it. Whereas when, when Bush is very popular, the Democrats aren't attacking him. They're supporting him. So you don't, you don't have this negative relationship between the two. But, uh, but people do distinguish between the parties in the sense that they don't have to like one and dislike the other. They can like them both. They can dislike them both. And they can sh shift in their evaluations uh, independently. Is that typical? Um, I mean, just because the relationship here is so extreme. You know, there's so many people that dislike the Republican Party right now, yet they aren't voting Democratic. Well, they probably vote Democratic, but they don't think well, particularly well of the Democratic Party. Parties, are, parties as institutions are not very popular in general. So, I mean, Democrats are, they get positive ratings there, you know, 50, 53 percent approval ratings. And Republicans get, um, you know, 38 percent, 39 percent. It's not. There's not dramatic differences it's there. And most partisans like their own party. They'll say something nice about their own party. So it's a partisan thing, and the difference usually comes from those who are independents who don't feel compelled to like their party, uh, uh, and to dislike the other party. Yes. Perhaps you've not studied this, but I would like your opinion on how large a role you think mainstream media has played in selecting our candidates for us. I don't think they have. I think if the mainstream media had been in charge, we would have Hillary Clinton as the nomination. She was, I think, the odds-on favorite, and everybody's predicted uh, Democratic candidate. Every, uh, I think the, the, the take on Obama was, hey, he's a fresh new face, and he looks great, but he's not ready yet. That he's got, you know, next time, two more, eight, eight years down the road, some seasoning in the Senate, what a great candidate. Not yet. It's Hillary Clinton's turn. Uh, and, uh, and, and until he beat her in Iowa, uh, and really turned, got, got the attention of the world, I think that, that that was the assumption. On the Republican side, there wasn't, I think, I think McCain initially uh, was, uh, had the best reputation among, uh, among the, the, the mainstream media, but I don't think there was an obvious candidate out there that they thought, oh, this is, this is the guy who's going to get it. And I think they were right, because e each one of the candidates you looked at early on you could predict what flaws they might have. You could predict the flaws that Giuliani would have. How does a guy who has this kind of bizarre personal life appeal to a party with, uh, with its core as these kind of family-first social conservatives? He just didn't fit that mold at all. And he had the, he, this, this kind of New York, wisecracking New Yorker guy. It just didn't, didn't fit. And, and Romney, you could see he would have problems um, with it being Mormon. Uh, that, uh, one of the one of the great ironies is that uh, he he never and still uh, still has been generated great suspicion among the conserv Christian conservatives in the Republican coalition because he's a Mormon. Now, in terms of political values, there is not any difference between those uh, espoused by Mormons and those espoused by Christian conservatives on every every dimension: abortion and any issue you want to name. They look identical, but theologically they're different. And so he had a theological problem that, uh, that turned out not to go away. So if you go down the list, uh, they, they, there was no one that the, me that the mainstream media could have focused on as the obvious candidate. Uh, and I think that that was, uh, and I think that's how they handled it. They weren't trying to annoy anybody.
Yes. Is there any historical parallel for the fact that the world view, or at least the Western and European view, is so predominantly one-sided? I mean, the support for Obama across 22 countries I recently saw was uniform, all 22 countries. Well, uh, the U.S. In, in many parts of the world is very unpopular right now. It's unpopular yeah. for various reasons, but the Bush administration is, is the primary uh, reason for that. And I think that most people in the world don't see McCain as a change or a sufficient change no, from I that. that. Yeah. I'm just asking his historically. Historically, I, I don't know. I imagine, uh, um, you know, Goldwater, Goldwater versus Johnson. I think Johnson would have had. Reagan. Pardon? Even Reagan. Re Reagan was more popular. Yeah. The, yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. But I, but I would think of Johnson Goldwater. I think the, there would be overwhelming support for Johnson against Goldwater oh, back yeah. in yeah. back in in '64. You know, Europeans loved Richard Nixon. It wasn't, it's not necessarily the same kind of ideological lines that we think about. They liked Nixon because he was this kind of smart statesman. He was kind of a more European style international uh, operator. Uh, and they could, they could kind of relate to him. Um, but you know, ever since I found the French loved Jerry Lewis, I thought he was a wonderful comedian. <laughs> I've, I've never, never taken the judgments about such, such things too seriously. Yes. I've heard that throughout much of the election, voters are just concerned with the candidate's personalities until the very end, that they want to focus on their policies and their ideas. I don't believe in that. Nah. So, I, 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 for one thing, I don't think you can ever say something like that about the voters. There are certain subsets of the population, like 80% have made up their mind last January who are they going to vote for. Whoever is the R or the D next to their name. Okay. Of the remaining 20%, uh, most of them have probably made up their minds by now. Again, based on things like their expectations about uh, uh, either whether or not they're going to be safe with one or the other. They're worried about you know, international attacks or they're worried about the economy, who's going to do a better job on the economy. That's policy. But they also want, they're also kind of selecting somebody somewhat in the dark. You know, you don't, you don't know what these people are actually going to do when they get in the White House. And so they w are perfectly sensibly focusing on whether or not this person seems presidential, seems intelligent, seems uh, uh, able to deal with a crisis in an effective way. And it's hard to make those judgments. But, the, but uh, you can say that's personality, but it's not really personality. It's really character. It's really, uh, it's really trying to make a judgment about someone's capacity to do the job. Uh, and I think most Americans take that decision fairly seriously. It's not, you don't really find people saying, I'd like, I'm going to vote for him because he'd be more fun to have a beer with. I mean, there'll be, there'll be 10 people who do that. But, but you don't say the voter does that or the voters do that. There are some, some small subset that may. But I think, uh, I think most focus on things that have to do with things that may be real to them or values that are very important to them. So if, you know, if you're, if you're, if, uh, you're pro-life and that's really what you care about, then Okay, that's an issue. You vote on the basis of that. You don't quite care who's carrying your issue, uh, as long as you know who's on which side. You know who to vote for. So I, I, I think what you're ma a more accurate statement is that the kind of people who are still making up their mind at the end of the campaign tend to be only marginally involved in politics, and therefore susceptible to uh, random things or things that aren't, uh, aren't solidly rooted because if they were susceptible to things that were solidly rooted, they would already have made up their minds. So you get people who don't pay any attention to politics, you know, five minutes before the, uh, or they, th they think about it in the, la in the last weekend beforehand, they may be susceptible to other kinds of, uh, kind of random things that happen. But not very many of them. Yes? And isn't that the <coughs> likely reason for the preponderance of uh, negative political advertising? Yeah. At the end, at the end, you're trying to you're trying to move those people who don't haven't paid any attention so far, and to catch them before they uh, as they're making up their minds. Yes. Um, so you you know you focused on the legacy of Bush and you <coughs> talked about how he's actually been a divider on the United. Now I get from this lecture, although I don't know, I haven't read your book, but that you you, you really rely on pulling at a, a great deal. I don't know. I'm kind of curious if you could comment on things that it may be difficult for polling data to get to. For example, there may be people, you know, they often do, you know, approve, you know, you're in the middle, you know, you maybe have five choices, you know, approve, severely disapprove, yeah. you know. But what about the people who think Bush should be tried for war crimes and put in jail, you know, tried at least and found guilty and put in jail, or 
the, the people that think he's trashed the environment, people think that he's done. Is there any way to gauge a legacy of the president in terms of how extreme things are that wouldn't even register on a poll like that? Yeah, I mean, there, you can ask that question, and pollsters have. Should he be impeached? And you get a fair proportion say yes. Like, in some polls, it's not just 40%. Say, okay, impeach the guy. On the other hand, I also have a polling question where the, the question is, do you believe that George W. Bush was God's chosen instrument in a, in, a internet, in a global war on terrorism, to fight a global war on terrorism? And you get about 15% of the population saying yes. That's about 30% of Republicans. And about another 15% say not sure, but the rest of their responses make you think they mean maybe. And that's <laughs> in about another 30%. So you have this one side that think, thinks of himself as a, a, God's anointed instrument. And of course, under those circumstances, you have to support him, right? I mean, God, God chose him, you, you, you have to support him. So you've, he's got that on one hand uh, at that extreme. At the other extreme are those who think he's a war criminal and would like to see him brought before justice. Uh, again, those are both, I think, there's probably more at the uh, God's chosen instrument level than at the uh, send him to jail level. But uh, both are minorities in the, in the overall population. Yes? Uh, Cheney has been the, probably one of the most powerful vice presidents in history, right? How is his legacy? Does it have any bearing on how Sarah Payman is perceived within both parties? Uh, yeah, I think there is a legacy there. I think that it's made the vice presidential choice more salient. Although I think Palin would have been very salient no matter whether Cheney had existed or not, uh, partly because of her character, partly because um, McCain's 72 years old and has had cancer four times. So it, it, people have to think of her right away as a potential president. But I, I think he's redefined the, pres the vice presidency in a way that I, I think future vice presidents will have to be Machiavellian to, uh, if they want to do it too. That is, that, is that, 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 that he's going to be a negative role model in a sense that uh, we, don't, you know, we don't want another Cheney. Uh, and, uh, and if somebody wants to be another Cheney, they can only be another Cheney by pretending not to be another Cheney. Uh, uh, but Cheney's role also reflects George Bush's decisions to let him play that role. And most presidents, are, are, I think, most people who get elected president are not going to allow the vice president to have that kind of uh, very powerful inside bureaucratic politics role in making policy in their administration. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's not just Cheney, it's Bush, and we're not going to have another Bush or, uh, and, and therefore not another Cheney. That's, that's my guess. Yes, way back there. Democrats are expected to have control of what lasts in Congress. Yeah. Even a blue luster group on the field. Remote possibility, yeah. And a Democrat in the White House. Um, when this has happened in the past, does it usually result in a backlash? Well, yes. I, the, uh, <laughs> if, you, if, you look, if you look at that, this is the last time the Democrats had full control was right, you know, here. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was, uh, 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 Democrats took over full in, in, in 1992 and two years later lost the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. Uh, it's very easy to imagine a backlash. In fact, if I were a Republican, I would say, you know, it wouldn't be so bad to lose this election. Why? Well, look at what the president's going to have to deal with. We've got two wars, an economy in serious trouble, a huge budget deficit, uh, uh, looming social security deficits, <laughs> Medicare deficits. There's nothing but major league problems down the road. None of those problems can be solved without inflicting a lot of pain on people. You're going to have higher taxes. You're going to have more, less generous spending on programs you care about. Uh, things are going to be taken away from you. Okay, and any president or any administration or any regime that tries to do that is not is going to have a hard time remaining popular very long. So, from a Republican's perspective, say, all right, let them try to deal with these problems, and then we will uh, we will deal with them later. We will uh, then uh, uh, mobilize the uh, those discontented parts of the population uh, on our side. And I think that's a very reasonable position for a Republican to take. And say, all right, let them take on the problems, and then. When they fail, uh, we'll be back. I heard yes. that um, a candidate has never been elected president if that ca candidate's uh, party has been both in the House and in the Senate ruling. What do you think about that? 
a, can Obama, a candidate has never been elected. President, his party is in both control of the House and the Senate. Well, of course, I, I think that's wrong. I, I'd have to see if I could go back and think of cases, but um, Bill Clinton was elected when his party controlled both, house, both the House and the Senate. Uh, yeah, that's wrong. Lyndon Johnson was selected. John Kennedy was elected. Jimmy Carter was elected. I don't know where you got that idea. <laughs> I mean, the reason I had an immediate answer is because it never occurred to me that this is a possibility, a question, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the data that you introduced in the first half of the lecture about the uh, changing voting preferences of different cohorts I found very striking. Is, do, you, do you have a feeling that that is kind of widely known, or do you think this is like a, a hidden secret of... Uh... I, you know, I, I think it's not widely known. It was, that chart was in the New York Times. I just did a version of it that I got from Michael. Uh, and so it was, it's, it, it, for somebody who reads the New York Times and pays attention to numbers like that, then yeah, it's, it's known. But it's not really uh, as well known as it should be. Uh, it's going to be in an article of mine soon, <laughs> uh, uh, after the, uh, waiting until after the election to finish up the time series, but uh, the various time series on this partisan stuff, but it's, it's going to be out there. I think it is the, the idea that um, there's a Reagan generation and so forth, that, that's known, and the, the New Deal generation, that, that was known in, in a general terms, but just that very specific pattern. I mean, that's a somewhat artificial pattern. Those are five, five year moving averages. So it's, it's cleaner looking than it would be if you had, it's cleaner looking than it would be with 17,000 observations. You had 170,000, it would still look like that, but, but with the number of observations there. And I'm very anxious to have a graduate student get on another, another set of surveys, like all the CBS surveys or all the uh, Gallup surveys, and do the same thing, where, they, where they've got an age number, just to see whether or not these Pew data are replicated by other data sets, because they are so striking. <laughs>